Welcome everybody to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is going to be part two of our reading and discussion of the the Magician Bhadra Sutra, the uh, Bhadra Mayakara Sutra. It's actually, I, I guess, the Bhadra Mayakara Vikaranya Sutra, right? The prophecy of the enlightenment of the magician Bhadra. Um, I spent a good deal of time in part one going over the title, going over the players, uh, the Buddha, the magician Bhadra. Um, I am going to uh, start with a kind of just a quick recap of the plot, because this is a very narrative driven sutra, right? Um, I think it, it goes without saying at this point, but it, it, in case it doesn't, I'll say it. This is one of those very allegorical Mahayana Buddha sutras, right? We're, we really do not, we, I don't think we would be wise actually to consider this a record of a historical event right, in the life of the Buddha. I mentioned this last time that this sutra is within a uh, tradition of what would be called the magic competition. Um, it's kind of a, um, a meta narrative story that takes place in Buddhism. Um, and what I mean by that is, is it's, it's a story about a magical competition between the Buddha and someone, but who that someone is and the specific uh, events that take place, it'll change from uh, storytelling to storytelling. It changes from rendition to rendition. The historian in me has to assume in some sense that this does go back to an actual historical event that may have taken place at Shravasti. This is what we talked about last time, that if you traced the, the genealogy, what would be other, otherwise be called the history, but if you trace the genealogy of this story back, you eventually get at <clears throat> the miracle at Shravasti. And I spoke about that last time and it's gonna come up again a little bit later. So I won't kind of get into that now, but that's sort of the origin or the original version of this story. The version that we have here that we're talking about, this is in the, the Ratnakuta Sutra. This is about a specific magician named Bhadra. And just to remind you of what the plot is of this version of the magical competition, this local magician, uh, wonder worker named Bhadra has, has this idea. And this idea is basically that everybody reveres the Buddha, the Tathagata. But if Bhadra, the magician, could, could best him, could trick him, could deceive him, then everybody would know that the, the Buddha is not truly enlightened and that Bhadra is a superior magician in that way. So that's Bhadra's big plan, that he plans to deceive or trick the Buddha in order to kind of gain reputation, to gain respect. One could even say to gain Bhadra, because I talked about this last time that this person's name, Bhadra, actually sort of means fortune or respect in that way. So there's, you know, again, this is very allegorical where the players represent things in that way versus being a historical event. I just wanted to kind of remind you of the other thing that happened last time after Bhadra uh, uh, inv invites, he invites the Buddha to this, this uh, um, an offering ceremony. Basically he invites him to lunch or invites him to a meal. And Bhadra walks away thinking, aha, I knew it. He's not a fully enlightened being because he didn't know he I was trying to deceive him. Had he known I was trying to deceive him, he wouldn't have accepted my offer. So haha, -ha, he must not really be a fully enlightened being in that way. <clears throat> so Bajra goes away thinking he's got one up on the Buddha. 
And not only that, but Madhulyayana, the the Buddha's left hand man, actually, like the one of the Buddha's chief disciples that stands on his left hand side, Madhulyayana, who interestingly enough is known for his abilities in the Siddhis. Uh, the Siddhis are these magical powers. This sutra is kind of about the magical powers in that way. And so allegorically speaking, Madhulyayana represents this tradition within Buddhism of the magical uh, monk, the wonder worker, the, the one who has developed these supernormal powers. So Madhulyayana, who, who has the supernormal powers, he knows what Bhadra is up to. And he's worried that the Buddha is going to get deceived. And so he goes running to the Buddha and he says, don't go, don't do it. Don't fall for the deception. And the heart of last, uh, the first session, the heart of last week was this beautiful uh, saying. It's, it's in many ways uh, the, the heart of this, of this sutra. It's really the, the I think the, the foundational message the Buddha says to Madhulyayana, don't think like that. Don't think that I could be deceived. Only those with craving, hatred, and delusion are able to be deceived. I wanted to get the language right there. Um, and so I spoke at length last time, gave you some examples or some ways to think about that. But we're going to continue with the story. But I want to make that known that that was sort of the heart of the teaching here, that someone, someone like the Buddha, who's beyond desire, anger, and confusion or delusion or ignorance in that sense, cannot be deceived. And that's, uh, you know, again, we spoke about it last time, but that's something to think about, the relationship between how you might be deceived, and then the relationship that has to something that you might want, or something you might be angry about, or something you're confused about in that way. Okay, so that's a kind of a, just a really quick recap of where we're at. Um, and now we can get into the fun part. Because as you can see, there's, there's a lot of action here tonight. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, let's just get to the next part. So I, I, I stopped it at that point where the Buddha gives this very, um, uh, meaningful, significant kind of um, uh, wisdom, right? But then Madhulyayana, they, there's a second part to this discussion with Madhulyayana, and it was a little too much for last time, so that's where we begin. So the Buddha again sp spoke to Madhulyayana, saying, Madhulyayana, what do you think? Is that magician Bhadra able to manifest a 3,000 great thousand world system and cause them all to be gloriously adorned? Madhulyayana replied, certainly not. The Buddha continued, Madhulyayana, you should know that I am able to manifest and adorn as many worlds as there are grains of sand in the Ganges River. And I am able to manifest them on the tip of a single hair. And still, this does not exhaust the spiritual powers of the Tathagata of the Buddha. So I want to talk about that. We, we kind of have to address like what they're, what they're talking about there again this is all about the the um the spiritual power of the buddha the spiritual power of the tathagata which is superior to the kind of magic of this bhajra person and so this this language that the buddha says where he says hey madhulyayana can can that magician bhajra manifest a billion world systems and, uh, and gloriously adorn them and put them on the tip of a hair. 
So, you know, if you've been coming to the Dharma doors or if you've read Mahayana Buddha Sutras, that should be very familiar to you, that, that idea. Um, of course, if you're not familiar with Buddhist cosmology, we definitely need to catch you up because there's a few things going on here. Um, of course, within the world of Mahayana Buddhism, they talk about not just one world here with its sun, moon, stars, and planets. That's a world system. Uh, what we, I guess, would call a solar system in a way. Uh, but in Buddhism, that's a world system. And if you were to take a thousand of those, that would be a small collection of world systems. And if you were to take a thousand of those collections of thousands, that would be a medium sized collection of world systems. And if you were to take a thousand of those collections of a thousand collections of a thousand worlds and put them all together, that would be a 3,000 great thousand world system, otherwise known as a uh, Mahasarasara Lokadatu, this uh, 3,000 great thousand world system. So that's Mahayana Buddhist cosmology, where we're not just dealing with one world, but a kind of a multi world system in that way. And then this miraculous power of the Buddha to one, gloriously adorn these world systems and then place them all on the tip of a hair. So because of where this is going, <laughs> I, I need to, to address sort of an issue. So I, it's just a way of thinking. I don't know how far we're going to get with this. I kind of, I don't want to spend too long on it, but it, again, it needs to be said. It's a very interesting idea. It's, it's in some ways an, a contemplation, uh, what we might even call a thought experiment in that sense. But, you know, what we're kind of talking about here is, it, well, first of all, we're talking about sort of this Bajra person who can kind of do some parlor tricks, little magic tricks here and there, right? Versus the magnanimity, the, 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 the greatness of a fully enlightened being. And if you wanted to sort of wrap your head around this, and again, this is just going to be an entry point. This is by no means exhaustive. But if you wanted an entry point to this, like, putting a billion worlds on a tip of a hair and all of that, I think one of the places to start is, and let me just make sure I'm kind of, yeah, I think, I think one of the places to start with this is, so <laughs> there's a, a, a very, 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 very old Greek saying. It's a very old pre-Socratic saying. And it is Anthropos Metron, which uh, translates as man is the measure. And it's, a, it's actually a very interesting statement. And I don't want anybody to get confused about what I'm saying here. This is a very old Western world, Greek world idea that says <clears throat> that man, humanity in that sense, is the measure of everything. And, you know, that's a really interesting idea. Um, in, in certain respects, it's sort of undeniable being humans in that way that we do sort of measure everything according to our, to our experience in that sense. And that's a kind of exactly what I want to kind of get at is, well, first of all, I guess I've been, I've been wondering, I've been wondering how this is going to come out and see the thing, the thing about it is, is that even if we were to really get really wild, let's get really wild, right? Cause that's what tonight's kind of about it. This magical stuff is about getting pretty wild. So we're talking about to, as a, as an initial, as initial uh, starting off point, we're talking about uh, honey, I shrunk the universe. 
right? <laughs> so, you know, you might have seen this old movie from back in the day, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, right? About this scientist guy that creates a machine and he can shrink down to the size of an ant. And he goes running around his backyard the size of an ant. And it's really wild because a blade of grass is so big, right? Let alone a flower, let alone a building, right? And so there's this way in which it would be really wild to be that small in that sense, right? So this idea of shrinking down and seeing the world from that perspective, right? Or we could imagine a, a different scenario where, where the scale is about growing. We are become a giant in that way. And now, you know, mountains and valleys become, you know, pretty much almost like planular or like a plane in that way. We are so large. So this could go one of two ways where we are very big and it's like, uh, relative to the human experience, very different or very small. And relative to the human experience, it's very different. And as wild as that would be, as wild as that would be to shrink down very small and go running around your backyard or grow very big and go running around the universe. What's interesting about that is that even if, as wild as that is, there's still a way in which the wildness of that is because of its relativity to what you consider, what I consider, frankly, normal. You know, uh, normal, <laughs> reality. And so part of the uh, thinking here, and again, I'm not trying to explain exactly how a Buddha would put a billion worlds on the tip of a hair, not exactly trying to explain that, but I am trying to kind of get us in, the, in a mode that would understand that. And I think the mode that would understand that is not the mode where we are very small or very large, because again, that would still be relative to the anthropos metron, this idea of man being the, the, the baseline to which everything is either smaller or larger. So part of the, the, the extreme liberation of the Buddha here is this idea that the scale has been destroyed in that way, meaning the, the what would be considered baseline, regular, normal size, and then smaller, larger. If you, if you go beyond that idea of a baseline measurement, things get really wild, <laughs> or at least conceivably they get, they get very wild in that way. So I just wanted to start with that, that idea that we are not just talking about the possibility of like a Buddha putting a large amount of things on such a small area. So it's not just about the shrinking or the growing, but it's actually about shifting the entire perspective or, or again, what we would consider to be baseline normal in that way. Any questions about that before I move on? I wanna make sure we're all really feeling nice about these ideas as we move along. Yeah, no. Um, so is it sort of related to the idea like of a Buddha understands that there's no objective reality, then the, hmm. the, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking that kind of is, you know, the idea that, you know, everything is relative to us is, is sort of part of or related to the idea that there's objective reality, like I'm here, the table's here, you're there, you know. So is it related to that? Is that the idea? It is directly related to that idea <clears throat> that exactly. <laughs> very much so that part of part of the conditioning is what we would i guess in the context of this conversation call scale yeah the, even the scale of things is going to be conditional and relative in that sense yeah. dependently originated <clears throat> on the on that note though no uh, on the point of your question i i was going to say this so this also has a lot to do with what would be called 
Buddha wisdom in a sense, or even prana in a sense. And an example that I've given in the past, it's, it's an analogy. And the analogy is of a, um, of a tracker, a tracker of animal prints. And the example that I've given is that someone who can, is really good at reading these tracks, it, you know, is really good at, I guess it would be called like induction or in, 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 in where you're <clears throat> or deducing in that way, but where you're using this evidence to reconstruct a situation that happened. And someone with the wisdom, the right eyes that can see these footprints, they can actually see what isn't present. They can see the animal that was there, how big they were, how fast they were moving, all of these things, even though they're not there presently. So it requires a kind of an eye of wisdom, not a physical eye, because the person with just physical eyes is just seeing the literal muddy, muddy footprint in that way. So if we understand that Buddha wisdom or the wisdom eye or prana in that way, transcendent wisdom, if we understand that it's sort of, it's operating from a place of, of wisdom in that way, kind of almost like logic, let's just call it that, right? And since it's operating from that level, it's not necessarily dependent upon these eyes, my height, let's say, because again, like a really good tracker, it wouldn't depend upon how tall or short they were in order to figure out what the prints uh, revealed in that way. And so I would relate it, no, I'd relate it to that too, also that the kind of the, the vision or the wisdom of the Buddha that can put these world systems on a hair tip, it's about seeing things from a very, very different perspective, even though the Buddha might be in a some sense embodied, but not using these eyes exclusively to see the world in that way. And indeed, I think it would, it, this is suggesting that there are some really, 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 you know, incredible ways of seeing the world when they are not anchored to the physical body that way. You know, and again, I use that tracking example as an, as a, as a real world example of how you can have wisdom and knowledge about events that are not dependent upon the events being there or even based on your physical eyes. It's very much a, a wisdom move, right? That opens up new ways of seeing. Okay, so that's just the, um, that part of it. There's also this other part of what the Buddha said to Madhugya Yana, which is, um, well, actually he said a few things, which is one, he can, the Buddha can manifest these uh, billion worlds or these 3000 great thousand world systems. Um, so first of all, there's that, this idea of actually creating these world systems. But then he says this other thing, which is, and he can gloriously adorn them. And I pause on this idea that the Buddha can manifest these billion worlds and then gloriously adorn them and place them on a tip of a hair. This sutra, what's about to happen is very much about adornments. It's, it's actually very much about gloriously adorning things. And I have been sort of dancing around this topic for Dar in Dharma doors for a while now. I'm sort of doing my own research on this idea where I'm really paying a lot of attention to where it comes up in, in sutras. I can tell you, you know, very, very simply, and it's gonna be made obvious in the sutra, even tonight, if I, if I get going, even tonight, but there's a way that when they talk about adornments, they are talking about beautification, like literally beautification. Like um, um, they're kind of mainly thinking about um, bouquets, arrangement, arrangements of flowers, maybe uh, lanterns and, and lamps and lights. Of course, light is, is um, 
Well, you know, the aesthetics of light are very serious. People, people get paid lots and lots of money to control lighting in that way. And so there is, if you really think about it, there is a way in which light can be very adorning. And I, again, it just in a very nice museum or very nice house in that way, the lighting can be adorning, flowers can be adorning, the smells of flowers can be adorning, incense, the smell of incense can be adorning, art, we're, we, so on one, on the one hand, we are literally just talking about beautification and adornment. But there's sort of a subtler metaphysical level to adornments that's, um, well, I think that it's part of what this sutra is actually interested in revealing. So I don't want to give it all away or even try to make all those attempts right now. But I just wanted to sort of reference that that this sutra is about the idea of adornment and I want you to have the idea of beautification in mind, but also be aware that it's gonna be a little more than that. So when it says that the Buddha can manifest all these worlds and gloriously adorn them, that's, you know, that's what we're gonna be interested in. What exactly does that mean? Does he put flowers everywhere? What exactly does that mean? Okay, so this was just, Again, the Buddha saying to Madhugyayana, "Don't don't worry. <laughs> you, you don't need to worry about it about anything." Okay, so there's that. But then he goes on, and this was really where I, you know, needed to say all these remarks because if you didn't really have all those remarks in mind, it's it might sound a little wild when the Buddha says Madhugyayana. You should know that there is a great wind wheel named crushing, which can destroy a billion world systems, a 3,000 great thousand world system. There is also a wind wheel named Vairamba, which is able to destroy worlds and then reestablish them. There is also a wind wheel named Rousing Motion which is able to spin and transform worlds. There is also a wind wheel named peaceful abiding, which blows to the highest levels. There is also a wind wheel named scattering, which is able to disperse Mount Meru and all the other mountains of a world system. There is also a wind wheel named fierce flames, and at the time of the burning kulpa, it blows blazing flames upward to the Brahma heavens. There is also a wind wheel named subsiding. And at the time of the burning kulpa, it is able to cause the fires of the kulpa to subside. There is also a wind wheel named cooling, able to cause a single cloud to cover 3,000 great thousand world systems. There is also a wind wheel named universal downpour. And when the fires burn the kulpa, it is able to descend upon and subdue the fires with a great downpour of rain. There is also a wind wheel named drying. And when the kulpa is flooded with water, it is able to cause all that water to dry up. If I were to fully explain all such wind wheels, even a kulpa would not be long enough, Matkuri Yama. You should know this. What do you think, Matkuri Yana? Is this magician Bhadra able to peacefully abide in such wind wheels even for a moment? Matkuri Yana replied, certainly not, world honored one. The Buddha said to Madhugyayana, in such wind wheels, the Tathagata is able to walk, stand, sit, and lie down without being moved. Moreover, the Tathagata is able to place such wind wheels into a tiny mustard seed, and the wind wheels would be able to function inside there with the mustard seed neither expanding nor contracting and without one obstructing the other. 
Magulayana, you should know this. The Tathagata can accomplish such magical dharmas limitlessly. Okay, so let's talk about what all of that might mean. So in order to kind of really get what the Buddha is talking about, so this is my demonstration of these wind wheels, okay, that the Buddha is spinning on his finger, right? Um, of course, this is just my imagination. This is just my attempt at this, of course, right? But let me tell you what they're talking about, or at least, you know, what the references are in that way. So these wind wheels, you should know that the general Buddhist cosmology, and this is quite the um, cosmodrama going on tonight. This is a cosmological drama that if you don't know the basics, you'll, you know, you're going to miss the drama in that way. So the general Buddhist cosmology, and I've given other talks that are in more detail about the specifics of this, but you know, Buddhist cosmology talks about a kind of creation period of the world or of a world system, a period of duration of that world system, and then each world system going through a period of decay until it finally reaches a period of nothingness, and then it is kind of reborn or recreated in that way. And so in the same way that beings are kind of in a cycle of death and rebirth, world systems are also in a cycle of death and rebirth in that way. And what they're talking about with these wind wheels is that traditionally, what happens is, is that these periods of creation, duration, and destruction, these periods last very long periods of time called kalpas. The sutra referenced this long period of time, eons or kalpas. And Buddhism has a very interesting cosmological view, which is that these periods of the world's life are punctuated with these disasters. In other words, at the end of a very long period, these seven giant suns appear in the sky and scorch the entire universe in a way and burn everything, leaving only very trace ethereal remnants, psychic remnants, actually. But then the world is sort of rebuilt, but then these suns show up again after kalpas and kalpas and kalpas, and it gets destroyed again. And after that happens enough times, seven times actually, but destroyed by fire, there's a giant flood. And that destroys almost everything, including the psychic subtle ethereal realms. And then some suns show up again, seven more times, and then there's another flood, and then seven more times of burning by suns, and then there's another flood. After seven floods, then finally a great wind wheel shows up. And this wind wheel destroys everything, e everything. And then eventually there's sort of this uh, resurgence again of the whole thing. So that's what's sort of being referenced in this are these epochs, these eons, these giant lengths of time. And this sutra has, has dropped a very interesting idea on us which is that the, the Buddha wields or can wield. Not only that, he can take a, apparently take a nap like inside of these 10 uh, much stronger wind wheels. And so I don't want to get too stuck in going through each one of them again, but I wanted you to know that they were referencing these various either like, let's say there was the one where there's a, also a wind wheel that is called universal downpour. And when the fires burn the kalpa, it is able to descend upon and subdue the fires with a great downpour of rain. So there is this kind of thing, the, the, the cosmological drama that's being spoken about here is that the normal order of things is that there are these 
epochal cultic periods of creation and destruction that are punctuated by these suns and these floods and these wind wheels. But what's kind of being spoken about here is the idea of the Buddha being sort of beyond that normal cosmological order. And in fact, he can wield these other wind wheels that can kind of overturn the natural order of what those, uh, what the fires or what the floods or what the other wind, wind wheels would be doing, okay? So, you know, I, I kind of drew this in fantastical fashion. I started tonight by referencing that, you know, this is an allegorical sutra. <laughs> it's very, very important to keep in, that in mind. So in other words, if you're, if you're kind of running away being like, what? The Buddha was, what? This is not, then you missed, you missed it because there, there are subtler things that are being discussed in here in that way. Um, which I'm going to try to get at, but I just want to make sure that you know all the references in that way. And by the way, just to take a really you know blunt step back, the Buddha is just basically saying that his his power of magic is way crazier than Bhadra's. Like if you wanted to just you know read it that way. Um, by the way, I also wanted to say this before we move on. Um, for all of the, the Dharma heads in the audience, if you were keeping track, you might have noticed that there were 10 of those wind wheels. And that, of course, isn't a coincidence because of, we learned from the Bodhisattva inexhaustible intellect that the Ratnakuta tradition, these Mahayana sutras are very decimal. Everything is kind of taking place in tens. Um, and so I just wanted, again, for the Dharma heads, I wanted you to note that there's 10 of those that you could kind of track to the 10 stages in that way, if you wanted to. Otherwise, everybody good? No questions, answers, ideas? Everybody good on the Cosmo drama? So at that time, Venerable Mahamad Gulyayana, as well as the great multitude, heard what the Tathagata had spoken. And at that time, they developed an unprecedented mind and bowed their heads at the feet of the Buddha. In one voice, they said, we have now encountered the great sovereign authority and spiritual powers of the great teacher and have received great benefits. If someone is able to hear the Tathagata, the world honored one, and learn of his spiritual power, giving rise to belief and understanding, then this person will certainly receive great benefits and give rise to the mind for supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. Okay, so everybody was delighted by hearing about the Buddha's great power in that way. And now the narrative continues. So then, the night before the big competition, the magician Bhadra went into the great city of Rajgriha, going to the lowest and most filthiest place in the city he magically transformed it into a place for teaching that was extensive, level, and square. The scent of flowers proliferated throughout the air, and it was covered with a jeweled canopy. There were also 8,000 rows of jeweled trees, and below each tree, there was a lion throne. Innumerable provisions were all arranged nicely as offerings for the bhikshus, the monks. Moreover, there were drinks and food of a hundred flavors, along with 500 servants wearing white clothes decorated with ornaments. Okay, so I just want to point out one thing very quickly. So Bhadra, you know, he goes to the lowliest, 
the, the Chinese is actually even rougher than the English translation gives it credit for, but it, the Bajra goes to the lowliest and most filthiest place in Rajgriha. And he basically cleans it up, makes it square and level, creates this jewel canopy, decorates it all around. The one thing that I just wanted to note, so that those are adornments. He magically adorned this place. What is this place? Well, if you were reading the English translation, then it's just called a place of teaching. And it's, an, it's unfortunate because um, that's kind of a gloss of a very interesting idea, a place of teaching. He created a place of teaching. The term place of teaching actually pops up a lot in this sutra, and that's because it, it's a little more significant than just a place of teaching. So in the Chinese, at least, and, and again, we don't have a Sanskrit version of this sutra, so we're re relying on, on the Chinese. And in the Chinese, the Chinese uses a very, very classic two-character term, this uh, Daozang. Now, in Chinese, this is called a Daozang. Now, the Dao is this idea of like Taoism is based on this idea of this universal principle or this universal law. It's called the way. It's the way, it's the law, the principle that governs everything. It's the way. And if you live in accordance with the way, that's kind of being a Taoist in that way, right? So that's Tao, but you know, if you've come into the Dharma doors, you know that I've spoken about how the early Buddhists, they used the word Tao for Dharma, for Buddhism, for, they used that word. So Tao as the way, the principle, the law, very related to Dharma. So that's cool. And then this other character, a Zhang. A zong is a, a field traditionally, like actually out, out in a field, but then it comes to mean a field or an area in that way. Before Buddhism gets to China, they, the meaning the Taoists and the Chinese already use this term Dao Zong to refer to a kind of place that you would practice the way, that you would practice the Tao in that sense. Um, it also had a kind of connotations of a kind of um, a clearing where you would do a ritual or a performance or something like that. So I just want you to know that this term Tao Zong, it has a kind of a pre-Buddhist history, a Taoist history, but the Buddhists, seized upon the, this idea of a Dao Zong. And what Dao Zong is translating is the idea of what would be called a Bodhi Mandala, a mandala of enlightenment. But a mandala in this sense is not something that you would hang on the wall and stare at. It's not that kind of mandala. No, this is a the Bodhi Mandala, as it's called, the Mandala of Enlightenment, is also often called the Seat of Enlightenment. And it basically refers to the, the place, the site of enlightenment where a Buddha gets enlightened. Traditionally, it is under a Bodhi tree, under a tree of enlightenment. But that's the idea of a Bodhi Mandala, the, the seat or the mandala of enlightenment. It's where a Buddha gets enlightened. I'm telling you all of this because I just want you to know, it, this doesn't come up often, so I'm, I'm using this opportunity, that, so this Buddhist idea of a Bodhi mandala, a site of enlightenment, comes to China and they call it a Daozang. This idea of a Daozong, but the Buddhist idea of this eventually goes to Japan. But the Japanese Buddhists, of course, or the Japanese entirely, they pronounce these characters differently than the Chinese. It's what makes the Japanese language the Japanese language is their pronunciation of these characters. And I want you to know that the way that these two characters are pronounced in Japanese is 
dojo. The idea of a dojo, you know, like with tatami mats where you might do karate or something like that. Well, the original idea of a dojo was that it was a daozang. It was a, a place of enlightenment. It was, a, it was where you would go to get enlightened. And even though a modern dojo is probably more related to kung fu and karate and things like that, there is this, you know, a very close connection with the Zen tradition in Japan that would re very much refer to their meditation halls as dojos, but the original idea of a dojo as a place of enlightenment. I say all of that to really kind of want, to, want you to have a vision for what the magician Bajra has erected. He's created a dojo. He's made a place to practice. Yes, it's a place for the Buddha to teach, but it's more than that. He's created a site of enlightenment. Okay, so there's your etymology for tonight, the etymology of the word dojo, right? Uh, very long old history. Okay, so this is where we get to the fun part of the story. So the, the magician Bajra, and I don't know if you'll be able to tell, has created his dojo, has created his Daozong. And that's kind of here. But then what happens is, after these miraculous transformations, the four great heavenly kings arrived at the assembly place and spoke to the magician Bajra saying, you have made these transformations of adornments and provisions as offerings for the Tathagata, as offerings for the Buddha tomorrow. And from these causes and conditions, you will attain great merit. We also wish to help you make offerings to the Tathagata. Would you permit us to create a second palace for the teaching, a second dojo by magical transformation? When the magician Bhaja heard what had been said, his mind was curious and he immediately granted their request. Then the four great heavenly kings immediately manifested innumerable wondrous adornments and furnishings twice those of the magician Bhadras. <laughs> All right, so um, this is also part of the cosmological drama. I drew them the first time. In the first mural, there were these four heavenly kings. They're seated on these four heavenly mountains. This is part of the Buddhist cosmology. So, you know, the basic Buddhist cosmology is there's this great mountain called Maru that's in the kind of the middle of the world. And then we live around Mount Maru. But then at the outer part of the world, there are these uh, heavenly mountains. Where are the, there are these four heavenly kings, as they're called, guardian kings in the north, south, east, and west. And these four heavenly kings are very, very important. Um, well, I could say a lot about them, but the one major thing that's very interesting about these, and this is a very old Buddhist cosmology here, but these four heavenly kings are considered guardians because they actually are said to create this kind of force field that keeps intense cosmic rays from hitting the earth. Interestingly enough. So they're kind of a personification of the atmosphere or our idea of the atmosphere is a scientific vacation of the idea of the four great heavenly kings. Right, we could do it that way too, right? But the idea is, is that these are these kind of guardians of the world in that way. And they're the ones that first come to Bhadra's dojo and say, wow, you're, you're, you're getting ready for the Buddha to come. Can we make offerings as well? <laughs> and Bhadra, of course, a little reluctantly says, yeah, sure, okay. And then the god, Chakra Devanam Indra, along with 30,000 
Deva Putras or child gods came to the dojo and spoke to the magician Bajra saying, I also wish to help you to make offerings to the Tathagata and adorn this place of teaching. The magician was startled, but he once again permitted it. Then that Lord of Devas, Chakra Devanam Indra, for the sake of the Buddha, the Tathagata, by transformation, created a hall that was similar to the extraordinary palace of the heaven of the levels of 33. Indra also by transformation established Parajita flowers, Kobidara flowers, and other wondrous heavenly trees such as these arranged all around in orderly rows. When the magician saw these things, he cried out in fear and remorse wishing to take back his transformations. He exhausted all of his mantra techniques, but the magical illusions he created remained just as they had before. And he thought, this is extremely strange. Since long ago, I have been able to use my mind to hide or manifest illusory transformations at will. It is only now that I am unable to make them disappear. Certainly, it is this way due to the Tathagata. Then Chakra Devanam Indra was aware of the thoughts in Bhadra's mind and spoke to the magician thus, saying, Because you have now done this for the Tathagata, the adorned dojo, the adorned place for the teaching, is unable to disappear. From this, you should know that if there is someone who brings forth even one recollection in his mind for the sake of the Tathagata, then this good will, not, will ultimately be a cause for their nirvana. After hearing the Lord of the Devas speak thusly, Bhadra's mind was extremely happy. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so just to just to make clear, um, so this this is sort of the 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 turning point in the sutra, of course. So the four heavenly kings show up, <clears throat> they make a palace, then Indra shows up, makes an even greater palace. Bajra tries to take his away and uh, is unable to do so, and gets this sort of lesson from Chakra Devanam Indra. So before we kind of move to the next section, if you didn't, if you don't kind of get the, the message of that little part, I want to share a, it's an old classic story. It's actually not even a Buddhist story. It's, um, um, it's like an Indian folk story and you can kind of uh, plug in whichever god you want. Um, I've heard the one with Shiva, um, but you can, you, again, it's hardly the point. But the story is, it goes something like this. And again, this isn't a Buddhist story, but I think you'll catch the relationship. So the story is, is that there was a, a guy in a town where there was this statue of Shiva and everybody worshiped Shiva. And this guy couldn't stand it. And so every morning he would get up and he would gather a bunch of pine cones. And then he would go to the statue and he'd be oh, Shiva. And he would throw pine cones at the statue and basically curse Shiva's name. Every day he did this, right? <laughs> Eventually, this guy dies, and he goes up to the level of the 33 heavens, and he's met by none other than Shiva. And Shiva's sitting there with arms wide open saying, welcome, welcome to my heavenly realm. And the guy's perplexed, and he's like, what do you mean? I don't belong here. And he's like, of course you do. And he's like, no, I don't. I was, I, I hated you my entire life. What are you talking about? And Shiva says, no, not at all. 
Every morning you went and gathered offerings for me and you made offerings. Every day you chanted my name over and over again. You were my most devoted disciple. <laughs> so that's the classic Indian or Hindu story, which I think you can see the relationship that that's sort of the, um, I would say that that's the punchline and I'm kind of, like there's a way in which this, you know, this sutra is not entirely, you know, uh, made for television in that way. So there's a way in which you would want it to pause here a little longer for the punchline in that way. So that's why I'm pausing here because there's this kind of reversal or this realization in that way. And this is where I want to go back to the adornments idea for a second. So the story, of course, Bajra is a magician. And so, you know, they're, we're talking 8,000 uh, jeweled trees, jeweled canopies, all these things that he manifests, right? Or he produces by magical transformation. And, you know, this is a story. And I think that this is meant to be very visual and visualized. So, you know, there's that. But in terms of what the story is talking about, when Bajra goes to the low, lowest, most filthiest place in Rajgriha and kind of does this form of magic, you know, I think there's this way that we are to read that as like Bajra, you know, remember Bajra started off, he wanted to trick the Buddha, he wanted to deceive the Buddha. And I think that we are to understand that like, um, I've, you know, I've been trying to think of a, of, of a way to kind of phrase this, but, you know, you can think of it as, you know, we have these, um, you know, San Francisco, we have the Tenderloin, uh, LA has Skid Row, we have these like really, really rough parts of the city, right? These really rough parts of the city, very down and out. And I think that there's this way in which you could read Bajra's original intent as, ha ha, I'm going to trick the Buddha into coming to the tenderloin. And I'm going to do it by making it seem like it's really fancy, but he'll really, in a way, um, get tricked and defiled by coming to the lowest area of the city. And if you go back to that original saying of the Buddha, where he said, you know, only those with greed, anger, and delusion can get deceived. I think there's this way that, yeah, I think if somebody was not enlightened and very judgmental and especially very whatever, bougie, let's call it, bourgeoisie in that way, yeah, that person with greed and anger towards the poor or something, they could probably get tricked, right, into going to some party in the Tenderloin just because it's in a fancy hotel. But then it's like, ah, tricks on you. You actually were in the, the you know, bad part of town. But for the Buddha, of course, there's no bad part of town. The, the Buddha has no such judgment in, in, at all. And so I think there's that interesting thing that's going on that Bajra, Bajra is the one with the judgment. Bajra is the one that sees things as good or bad, wants the fame and all of that. So there's that, his original kind of uh, uh, way that he wanted to trick the Buddha. But then, of course, the joke's on him in that way, because if you if you think of this a little less um, magical in that sense of just like producing jeweled trees, but if you think of it more as like, um, you know, that you imagine that imagine Bajra found some venture capitalists. Right, he found some some venture capitalists to go in on this uh, um, revitalization of downtown Rajgriha, right? And so, kind of conjured up a bunch of stuff. There's this way in which you know what Chakra or what Indra was saying was is like, wow, you you've made a tremendous offering to the Buddha by doing this, by cleaning up this 
lowliest, filthiest part of Rajgiha, decorating it, adorning it. Like, wow, you really do love the Buddha. You really love the Dharma and the Sangha, don't you? <laughs> right? And that's where Bhadra has been like, it's like, oh, wow. So, so I, I just did, didn't want that to go fully unnoticed in that way. Okay. Everybody okay with where we're at? All right. So now, after the night had passed, right? So after all of this had happened, uh, Bhadra went to the place of the Tathagata and spoke to the world honored one saying, I have now finished the undertaking. So please show your compassion and kindness. At that time in the morning, the world honored one, the Bhagavan put on his robe and picked up his alms bowl with a great multitude encircling him. He entered the city of Rajgriha and proceeded to the place, to the place of the magician's place for teaching, went to the dojo. In the land of Magadha, those of outer paths, such as the Brahmins and so forth, they all wished that the Tathagata would be deceived by the illusions of the magician. Because they wanted to see this, they all came to the assembly. The bhikshus, bhikshunis, upasakas, upasikas, happily wished to perceive and hear the Tathagata's spiritual transformations and lion's roar. They also gathered at the assembly. At that time, the Tathagata, the Buddha, through the spiritual power of the Buddha, caused that magician, as well as the Lord Chakra, as well as the four heavenly kings, to each perceive the world honored one in their place of adornment. At that time, when the magician had seen this, he abandoned his pride and bowed at the feet of the Buddha. He spoke saying, world honored one, I now repent to the Tathagata. Previously, I rashly attempted to deceive the Buddha by producing magical transformations of many adorned things. Although I came to regret this, I was unable to make these things disappear. At that time, the Buddha spoke to the magician saying this, all sentient beings, as well as the provisions are all illusory transformations. They are like illusory transformations brought about by karma. The bhikshus and bhikshunis in this assembly are also illusory transformations, but they are like illusory transformations brought about from the Dharma. My body is also an illusory transformation conjured up from wisdom. All worldly realms of the 3000 great thousand world system are also illusory conjured up by the totality of all sentient beings. Worldly existing dharmas are without any that are not illusory, conjured up by the combining of causes and conditions. Now you should give away these illusory provision, give away these illusory provisions of drinks and food one by one. Okay. So a couple different ideas. One idea I want to go back to because it, it keeps getting repeated and I want to uh, mention it. So if you go, or I'm going to go back to the paragraph before this, where it was, it's this funny thing. It, it, this sutra just gets better and better, frankly. It, it's so funny. So here's a funny thing where it says that all of these uh, those of the outer paths, right? All of these fringe heretics and Brahmins and all these people, right? It says um, uh, that they all came to the assembly because they all wished that the Tathagata would be deceived by the illusions of the magician, right? So they all showed up to watch the Buddha fail, right? 
But then it says that all of the monks and nuns and lay men and lay women, the upasakas and upasikas, they all came to the assembly because they happily wished to perceive and hear of the Tathagata's spiritual transformations and to hear the lion's roar. And so, you know, of course, that's a funny thing, right? Where all these people that have come to watch the Buddha fail, it's, it's ironic, of course, that they have all come to a Dharma assembly, right? So they, it's, this, again, there's a funny, funny message of how, of this sutra, right? So there's that, that all these people showed up just to watch the Buddha fail. But then it says that all of the monks and nuns and laymen and laywomen, they all showed up because they wanted, they were getting, they were delighted, happy to see these spiritual transformations of the Buddha. So this is actually a kind of a technical term. It's called a vikurvana, V-I-K-U-R-V-A, like N-A, vikurvana. And this is word, this word vikurvana, it will get translated a lot of different ways into English because it's not a, um, it's not an idea that has really gotten much attention. And so it's not considered one of those crucial dharmas or one of those crucial ideas. So it gets translated a bunch of different ways, but what a vikurvana is, is traditionally the bodily transformations of the Buddha, as it would be called the actual kind of like, um, well, you know, this can be understood a lot of different ways but it's everything from kind of like literally shape-shifting one's appearance um, to a bunch of different, a bunch of different bodily transformations. And this all falls under the general category of those siddhis or spiritual powers I talked about at the beginning of the talk tonight. So these siddhis, these spiritual powers, they're, of course, I've, I've spoken about them in Dharma talks past. They're a very old idea. They're not, you know, Buddhism sort of inherits these ideas. I, I don't, I dare even say that they're ideas in that way. It's kind of a science of yoga and meditation because everywhere from China to ancient India to you name it, People claim that if you do yoga slash meditation well enough or long enough, you display or develop certain supernatural powers. Things like levitation, passing through solid objects, reading people's minds or thoughts in that way. One, the ability to be multiple places at one time would fall under the category of a vikurvana in that way. But I want you to know that it, 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 it may not be clear in this, but Mahayana, the Mahayana Buddhist tradition is, is um, it's having a little bit of, not fun, but it's, it's making a statement about magic and it's happening in this sutra with all of these uh, wind wheels and all of that. And, you know, these spiritual attainments, I'm using that word specifically because they are considered uh, samapati. They are considered attainments. Um, and of course the Buddha, even in the early tradition, he kind of warned, warned against boasting of these attainments. But if you read a Mahayana Sutra, especially a Mahayana Sutra like the Vimalakirti Sutra, there's an explicit critique of the superpowers uh, in the Vimalakirti Sutra. And what I mean by that is, is that, you know, just to, just to paraphrase it, just to really just say it very simply, if somebody's running around saying, I can fly, well, that's a sure sign that they have a, an investment in the ego in that way. So Mahayana Buddhism is kind of saying that any sort of claim to an attainment by you, by someone, is probably not that interesting or special from the point of view of a fully enlightened Buddha in that way. In other words, like 
a lot of the idea or discourse about magic or the spiritual powers, they're originally based on the idea of an existent self, or at least an existent body, even if there's not a self, there's like an existent body that is performing these miracles, right? But if you, you know, if you get to the end of the sutra here, or sorry, the end of where we read this evening, all sentient beings are like illusory transformations, right? That's the kind of the message of this um, particular type of Dharma here. And so the magic that's being discussed here is not going to be uh, walking through solid objects or something like that. The, the, the magic of the Buddha is going to be like to be in every world system in the 3000 great thousand world system at one time kind of a thing. So, um, and, uh, you know, I just want to say too, that when they talk about the Buddha or an enlightened being having these abilities, um, yeah, I don't even pretend to know <laughs> what they're talking about in that way. Um, I'm just kind of aware of the larger discourse that's happening in that sense. Um, so I wanted to say that about the Vikravana. And so all of the bhikshus, bhikshunis, upasakas, and upasikas, they just want to see the Buddha's magical transformations. They're excited about that, right? Um, so I wanted to point that out. Um, okay, cool. Um, so I think... Yeah, so I think the, really the only thing to really discuss, and this is kind of a good stopping point in the story. So the only thing to really discuss is it's the, you know, the big um, portion of the sutra as far as like the, the Buddha, what has the Buddha said tonight? Tonight, the Buddha has said, all sentient beings, as well as the food, all of these provisions are all illusory transformations. They're all Vikurvana. They're all illusory transformations. They are like illusory transformations brought about by karma. And just to contrast this, it, he's going to go on to say that all the monks and nuns of the assembly are also like illusory transformations, but they are like illusory transformations brought about from the Dharma, right? So I just want to just contrast those two very quickly to kind of make one final point about, um, well, illusory transformations. I want to make one final point about illusory transformations. So this beautiful line at the end, the Buddha says all sentient beings. So not just humans in that way, right? Animals, gods, ghosts, all sentient beings as well as provisions like food and what have you, are all illusory transformations. They're illusory transformations brought about by karma. So karma in this sense, of course, um, you know, Buddhism uses karma in a very particular way. And the basic idea of karma as it pertains to these magical uh, or illusory transformations of sentient beings. How is it that all the phenomena, but in particular, all sentient beings, how is it that they could be illusory transformations brought about by karma? Well, if you, if you can kind of, um, put your thinking, your Dharma caps on, your thinking caps on. In this case, when we talk about karma, yeah, we mean action or activity. And yeah, we mean activity of the body and mouth and mind, but in particular, they're referring, it seems to me that they're referring to activity of the mind. So karma of the mind. And in particular, they might be referring to a specific kind of karmic activity of the mind, which we would call uh, samskara, right? The conditioning, habitual thought formations, kind of an idea, right? And, you know, the basic idea of all of this teaching is it goes something like this. 
um, I'm going to show you one of my images, right? And the idea here is, is like, oh, look, <gasps> it's a sentient being, right? And now, of course, the idea is, is maybe you saw one kind of sentient being, maybe you saw another kind of sentient being. Of course, which kind of sentient being you saw, a duck or a rabbit, would be very dependent upon the conditioning of your mind, the conditioning of your sensory organs, the conditioning of your mental faculty, um, a lot of different things. You know, maybe you've never really ran into a lot of ducks or images of ducks, but you've, you're really accustomed to rabbits. You watched a lot of Bugs Bunny as a kid. And so you're just really used to that. So you're very conditioned to see things even that would re slightly resemble rabbits. You would see a rabbit in that way. Of course, the, the, the big teaching of the Dharma is that all phenomena is rather like that that we are seeing and experiencing our conditioning much more so than we are experiencing something out in objective reality in that way. So if you can kind of, if you could imagine this, not as a optical illusion, not as a piece of paper, but as an actual, you know, like, well, what you might think was a sentient being. And it like ran across the road. And you might think it's a duck, or you might think it's a rabbit. The idea, of course, is, is that the experience of seeing it as a duck, or the experience of a seeing it as a rabbit, is going to be entirely based upon your karma, upon your conditioning in that sense. And so the teaching here is that well, the teaching is, is that I could show you optical illusions all night. I have a whole pile of them and we could go through them. But the, the real dharmic level is to understand that you, you might think I'm a human being, a human sentient being. Well, and you might think that I'm a human sentient being because I have the characteristics of that human sentient being. Well, that's like thinking that this has the characteristics of a duck or a rabbit, and therefore you think it's a duck or a rabbit. So I'm displaying, apparently, the characteristics and qualities of a human, and therefore you are imagining that that's what this is. The Dharma here, the deeper teaching is, is that that might not be what's actually going on, but the experience that you're having is now based upon your karma, your mental karma, or your conditioning in that way, not on something actually out there. That, that of course, should sound pretty familiar to regular Dharma door attendees in that way. We talk about that idea a lot, but I just wanted to put it in terms of this beautiful phrasing, right? That all sentient beings are all illusory transformations. They are illusory transformations brought about by karma. So now, what a beautiful sentiment to say that the monks and the nuns, the bhikshus and bhikshunis, that they are also illusory tra uh, transformations, but they are like illusory transformations brought about from the dharma. It's a beautiful, beautiful idea, you know? If you wanted to, to um, if you wanted to taste that a little bit, if you wanted to touch that idea a little bit, you know, a lot of it, you know, I say human, right? I have the characteristics of a human in that way. Maybe I shouldn't have gone so far as the hum played the human card, right? We back it up, and and I talk about this a lot too about the characteristics and qualities of oh I don't know being a male because I have a beard or whatever, right? Or these different things and these characteristics or qualities that are attributed to certain things, and then perceiving as me being in that category or something to that effect. If we understand everything that I just said about 
samskara, conditioning, and perception in that way. And we understand, oh, wow, the, the, the qualities, these qualities that I'm judging everything on, they're not out there. They're in here in that way, right? So the wisdom, the Dharma, I would say, the wisdom, right, is this sort of understanding that, oh, I might be projecting onto Michael whatever, whatever, based on these characteristics or qualities. Therefore, it might be wise to sort of not do that in a way. And what I mean by that, of course, is a kind of, um, what would it mean? I speak about this a lot too. What would it mean to see someone not relative to the opposite sex, not relative to anything, but to actually just encounter, uh, yeah, I mean, I, get, I, I actually start to lose words at a certain point, right? Because I realize, oh, wow, everything's going to be relative and conditional in that way. Well, part of, I think, the, the, the real beauty of monasticism, Buddhist monasticism in that sense, is that part of the shaved head, the very... Uh, asexual garb where, you know, quote, men and women look very much alike because they're wearing exactly the same kinds of robes, shaved head. I think a lot of that is about trying to move more towards a, a way of seeing people, sentient beings and everything that is not uh, categorical in that way, putting people in categories in that sense. So, Again, I would then say that it's a beautiful idea that what is it to be a, a monk or a nun, a bhikshu or a bhikshuni? Well, it's to be an illusory transformation like all the rest of us illusory transformations, but to be an illusory transformation of dharma rather than, say, social conventions or something like that, right? The Buddha goes on to say, just to finish off this section for tonight, the, the Buddha goes on to say, my body is also illusory, conjured up from wisdom, right? And of course, I think that when the Buddha says my body, I don't think he's talking about, you know, his six pack and his, you know, I don't think he's talking about the physical body. He's saying that speaking, <laughs> Speaking as a fully enlightened being, speaking of my body as a, as a Buddha, my body is, uh, is made of wisdom in that way, all right? And I'd, I'd refer to the comments I made about the tracking of the animals and the wisdom eye that isn't based on the physical body, the wisdom eye. That's kind of the body of the Buddha in that way that is conjured up from wisdom. Buddha goes on to say, all worldly realms of all 3,000 great thousand world systems are all illusory, conjured up by the totality of all sentient beings. Uh, you know, it's, it's late, so I can't open this one up entirely, but this was a very, this is a very interesting idea, right? So, all worldly realms, right, are illusory, conjured up by the totality of all sentient beings. If you wanted to kind of think about that or consider that, I think a really interesting place to look is language and the, the great language game that we're all playing where we all share this, or, you know, this use of language and then we, meaning if you can hear me and understand me, share this English language in that way. And that language game only works by all of our collective playing of that language game. And so if you were with me in the removal of an objective reality, and it's kind of more of this deeply intersubjective experience, well, the intersubjectivity, the the sinews, the sinews of this intersubjective experience is definitely language. The way that we share language and even the way that when I talk and say things, they conjure up ideas in your mind. There, in many ways, there's nothing more magical than communication in that way, 
that that it happens at all is truly a miracle. <laughs> all right. Um, and then he says at the end, the last one, all finally, all dharmas, all phenomena, all everything, all worldly existing dharmas are without, there's none that are not illusory. They are all conjured up by the combination of causes and conditions. That's going to be a direct reference to pratitya samutpatta, to dependent origination, that all things are like illusory transformations because they are all built upon this magical co-arisen phenomena in that way. So that's uh, a very quick way of, of saying uh, how it is that all dharmas are illusory, being com combinations of causes and conditions. But Okay. That's it for tonight for the sutra. Any questions, comments, answers, ideas, epiphanies? Realizations. Wonderful. Then we're making great progress through our wonderful sutra. Um, yeah, it's a Dharma feast next time. We're gonna we're gonna chow down on some Dharma offerings next time. So I hope you can come back for that. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.